good. Um, okay. Yeah, so welcome back, everyone. Um, so I'm going to uh, share this this next uh, little section. I'm very pleased to welcome Eduardo uh, Alejandro Martinez Ceseña, who is from University of Manchester, uh, known to his friends as Alex. Um, that's uh, the speaker, not University of Manchester, it's known as Alex. Uh, so yeah, warm welcome and hopefully everyone is uh, whatever uh, they need to get a cup of tea, a cup of coffee is ready to, to resume. So Alex, you know, just briefly introduce yourself, maybe just a moment or two, and then uh, yeah, tell us more detail about integrated energy network analysis. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you, Keith. Uh, well, uh, as Keith correctly mentioned, uh, my, my name is Eduardo Alejandro Martinez Ceseña. A, a lot of people struggle to pronounce that, but he seems to have been able to pronounce it properly. So th that's why I go by Alex, because it's, it's much easier to, to pronounce and remember. Uh, I work as a research fellow at the University of Manchester. My focus is on multi-energy systems, and I also teach what is power flow and optimal power flow which is quite in line with what this presentation is going to be about us. It's about power flow and optimal power flow applied to multi-energy system. And well, this, this presentation was, was prepared, or the tutorial was prepared in, in collaboration and with the support with, uh, from Professor Pierluigi Mancarella, who is part in the University of Manchester and part in the University of Melbourne, or mostly in the University of Melbourne. But he's still very, very focused uh, still doing a lot of, of work in, in, in Europe. So uh, this tutorial fits really well with what Keith and Graham were presenting before. So we're going to be focusing a bit more on, on the networks, but mostly on the integration of the network, some of the models that were mentioned before. Uh, we're mostly going to be focusing on how to simulate them and optimize them, that is, in other words, to run the power flow, to run the optimal power flow, and some variations of these models, especially to capture flexibility services and uncertainty. And throughout this presentation, we're going to be getting or well, highlighting some key literature from, from different colleagues ac across the world and presenting some examples, although most of the examples are, are coming from us as we are more familiar with, with that information. So the outline is of this presentation is I'm going to go briefly uh, dis to discuss the background, which is very in line with what was presented before. I'm going to be highlighting some of the key ideas that were presented in, in the previous presentation. And then we're going to move on to the power flow, the optimal power flow, and just a, a small summary of the key ideas presented throughout the tutorial. So what is the background? Pretty much what was mentioned before. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a power engineer by, ba by background, so my focus is electricity, but it's, it's no longer only about electricity, even for us. If we start looking into how the system is evolving into the, the future targets, mostly for decarbonization, for energy efficiency, we're going to notice that there's a lot of investment or a lot of forecast that rely on the introduction of multi-energy technologies or multi-carrier technologies. In, in this case, I'm just highlighting two of the future energy scenarios for, for the UK, which highlight that we're likely going to have high integration of electri electrified heating, in this case, air source heat pumps. But these scenarios also include other technologies like hydrogen, uh, mostly the the, the country and, and the world is recognizing that we need this type of, of technologies to decarbonize the energy system, to make it more efficient, uh, basically to tackle the, the trilemma that was mentioned before. We want affordability, we want sustainability, we want resilient systems, uh, but that's, that's not easy unless we take flexibility from different vectors. What does that mean? Uh, again, some, some ideas that were highlighted before that we are shifting from the idea of using vectors to using services. And this was discussed before, but I want to make it very clear that this is a very powerful idea because it changes the way we look at the system. We now understand or we are going towards the idea that the users, what they need are services 
and not necessarily vectors. How, how does that look once we look into the system? Before we would say the customers need electricity, they need heat or in this case gas. So we would provide them electricity with a dedicated network and we would provide gas with a dedicated network. And even in this example, you, we can see that ultimately in this case, they were not using the gas, they were using the heat. So once we change from this philosophy of saying they use vectors to they need services, we start thinking, okay, they don't want electricity. What they want is lighting. What they want is to be able to cook, transport, and so on and so forth. And the customers don't necessarily care that much where that energy is coming from, where that service is coming from, as long as the service is cheap, it is sustainable. So the moment we decouple the vector from the service, we can start thinking, okay, uh, if it's not only electricity, if it's not only gas, if it's not only the heat network, then we are not bound to try to solve our environmental targets just with a single network. We don't have to rely only on electricity. We don't have to rely only on gas, but we can actually use combinations. We can use the spare capacity that we have in the electricity network. We can repurpose the gas network perhaps to transport hydrogen. We can use combinations as we see fit. And as we have more options, we, find, we can find better ways to decarbonize the energy system more cheaply, more sustainably, and to make the systems more reliable, stronger. Why stronger? Let's say in this case, if the power network uh, were to have a contingency, the customers lose their connection. Whereas in this other uh, future, this other perspective where we're using combinations, even if they lose one network, there are still ways that the service can be supplied. So this ideology allows us to create more uh, stronger and, and better systems. So now, why do we care so much about the networks? Well, because once these customers have these multi-energy technologies, once they start using those, when we start using those technologies to provide different type of services, different type of flexibility, that means that there are going to be active customers exchanging multi-energy flows between themselves. So the, the whole idea of you can sell your surplus renewables, your surplus sun to your neighbor, and for that, you need a network in between. And now if these technologies are multi-energy, that means if, if you're providing services with let's say combined heat and power, uh, heat pumps or other technologies that actually inject or extract flows from multiple networks, that means that by making a, a given service, you can be triggering constraints, you can cause uh, network issues in more than one network at a time. And another thing that we have to consider is that the networks are not only going to be constraints, they're not, just going, they're not going to necessarily limit the operation of the multi-energy system. They also can provide, they can be used to provide flexibility because the gas network has a volume of gas inside. The heat network is, has, let's say, a volume of uh, steam or water and that could be used as storage. So if we were to model these networks, we're not only trying to understand the technical limitations, but also the opportunities to use that flexibility. And that's when we start thinking, okay, how do we model this? How, well, how do we model it with the power flow? And later on, how do we optimize these different sources of flexibility going into the optimal power flow? So starting for the power flow, we, start, we need to think about, uh, to start from the basics, especially because this is a tutorial. We need to ask ourselves two questions to begin with. Firstly, how can we build the models? How, we, how can we create this coupling between different energy vectors, different uh, networks, which was mentioned before. And if we create such integrated models, do we need to solve them as an integrated system, as a single couple model, or can we solve parts of it independently? This is still within the part of the power flow. So we st we're, we're not doing optimizations yet. So these questions are about just 
and simulating those networks. So firstly, okay, how do we build the model? Firstly, we need to identify which are the components that couple the networks. So we know that the system is becoming integrated because we have multi-energy technologies that are creating interactions between the different networks. So, okay, we can highlight all the technologies that couple the networks and those are going to be coupling components. Does a coupling component have to necessarily be connecting two parts of the network? Not necessarily. That depends on, on the model. Uh, it was mentioned before that we can have what are called energy hubs. So for example, let's say you had an energy hub with heat pumps and gas boilers and they are supplying a customer directly. So there is no heat network. So if we had something like that, let me change my pointer to highlight some things. As an energy hub, this would look like something like this. So we have the two components and they're supplying a load. So within the energy hub, the heat pump itself is no longer connecting two networks. It's, con it's supplying directly to the customer because we wouldn't have this. But as the energy hub, the, it is connected to the electricity and gas network. So within the context of the energy hub, even a technology, like the, EH, like the EHP, which in this case wouldn't be interconnecting two network, becomes a coupling component because its operation affects other technologies, in this case, the gas boiler, that creates a connection with the other network. So basically, in, in order to find the coupling technologies, we can look into the technologies themselves, looking for coupling between different networks, but we can also see what's going on in whole energy hubs. Why is this important? Because in some of the models, we're going to be focusing on technologies themselves. So perhaps what's happening inside a building or just a generator directly connected to the network, or we're going to be looking at whole buildings as energy hubs, or perhaps districts or wider areas. So I'm gonna go back to my normal pointer. So now that we have the coupling components, we have identified them, we need to model them. And the easiest way to model them is using uh, effic efficiency matrices. So now that we have identified our technologies that are coupling the different networks, we use, a, use the efficiency to model how much of a given vector is being converted to another. If let's say the, the CHP is taking gas, how much of that gas is turned into electricity, how much it's turned into heat. This example here is based on fixed efficiencies, but this will, this will change. This can become an efficiency function depending on the technologies. So the efficiency of the CHP is usually a curve. So this would be a function rather than a single number. But for this example, we're just going to be assuming is a given number. So with this, we create efficiency matrices or we create energy hubs, the, the concept that was discussed in the previous presentation. And that is how we're going to be modeling the coupling between the networks. So now we have the energy hubs and the efficiency matrices, and we have the models of the different networks. Which models are we going to use? There are a lot of options. In this example, I'm just going to be focusing on the steady state, but as you're gonna be seeing uh, in other presentations, especially from Vittorio and, and Misha, there's a lot of complexity that can be added to, to these equations. So a, a lot of additional models can be included here. So once we have the equations for coupling the energy hubs and we have the different networks, we can try to solve them Let's say we can add them directly into an optimization problem. We could use all of these equations as constraints and we can add an objective function like minimizing the cost of the slack. And that would allow us to solve this problem actually using a simulation to solve this, this uh, an optimization to solve this simulation. But for this example, we're going to be using the Newton, Newton's method. And th there's a reason for that. 
So for, for Newton's method, we have to identify a vector of unknowns, the variables that we don't know within this, the different systems. Now we have electricity, we have heat, and we have gas, and we need to identify a vector of, of deltas. Basically the difference between the value that we're expecting the system to have versus the value that we're calculating. And there's an additional set of, of equations that are required for the Newton, for Newton's method, which is the formulation of the Jacobian, which is the part that I wanted to highlight to determine how we need to solve these, this type of power flow. Why? Because depending on the coupling technologies and how they operate or the assumptions that we make, we might be able to solve this system independently as just a set of decoupled networks, or we might have to solve it as a whole integrated system. So what are we looking into? We're looking into the matrices that couple the different networks. If we look into the Jacobian, we would see the normal components of the electricity model, the, the traditional power flow equations for electricity. And we would also see the steady state ones for heat and for gas. So what are these matrices? These are the matrices capturing how one network, how the operation of one network and including the different technologies affects the other ones. So if these matrices were filled with zeros, that would mean that the system is fully decoupled. So even if we had the multi-energy technologies, if this is all zeros, then we can still solve the models separately. We don't need, we don't need to, to fully couple them. Whereas if these are non-zeros, as is this case, we need to use the integrated model. What do, do these values mean? It actually is based on the assumptions that we have. So we know that the system has a set of unknown variables like voltage magnitude, like voltage angle, like pressures. If we have any technology that reacts to those uh, variables, either because it's in a different slug bus or it's basically, let's say if it reacts to voltages, we can have something like a, a generator just balancing the, the voltage in a node. If we have those type of technologies, they are going to create those interactions. In this particular example, we have in the slug of the electricity network, a gas generator. So that creates a direct coupling between electricity and gas. In the slug bus of the gas network, we have a gas boiler, which creates a coupling between heat and gas. And in the gas network, we have a compressor, which is maintaining the pressures in the gas network. And that is what is creating this coupling. What does this mean in terms of modeling? depending on the infrastructure you have, depending on the selection of the slug buses, you might have a coupled or decoupled model. And this is useful because if it's decoupled, it's easier to solve. Uh, whereas it's if it's coupled, it's gonna require more variables, more iterations, more computational work. Uh, it also highlights that even if, it, if you have an integrated network, you don't always have to solve it as an integrated system. You can always solve it differently, still decoupled. So we're gonna have a, a small example using uh, one of our test, test cases, which luckily is the, our, our university, the University of Manchester, as it has the three different networks. This particular example has a, a, a number of buildings, 39, 26, which are owned by the university. So we have detailed data and we need to model the other ones because we, if we want to run the power flows, we need to know their demand. So these ones are usually used for power flows, whereas the 26 are used to reduce, to identify solutions to reduce emissions, to reduce costs and so on and so forth. And these buildings are connected to the three networks that, that were mentioned before. So as we're still not optimizing, we're still just doing the, the simulations with the power flow, 
we need to have some married order, some rules, or some predefined operation of the devices to know how much they are generating. So for these cases, we use things like heat following mode or predefined operation of the devices. So we're not optimizing per se their performance. We are just uh, predefining how they work and we're using the power flow to know how they affect the networks. So this is usually used by investors to understand, for example, what would happen if the future was all electric in this case do we shift to just uh, electrifying heating? So just heat pumps. These are the Sankey diagrams that conveniently Keith also highlighted. What this show are the input vectors and how they are being converted into what the system actually needs. In this case, heat and electricity. And in between you see all the conventional, the conversion components. So for example, uh, you have the heat pumps that are taking the electricity and they are converting it to heat. So taking the, the understanding from the previous slides about the, uh, the need for integrated modeling, we can check in each case, although that this would require looking into the, the actual location of the devices and the slug buses, if this, if this uh, different features have to be modeled with integrated or decoupled network formulations. For this particular example, only the one in the middle, which is the business as usual, is still a decoupled system because mostly we're using the traditional approach that we supply electricity and we supply gas, whereas the other ones use the multinode technologies to couple, well, to electrify heating or to create a stronger coupling this should be, this is a typo, so this should be CHP, EHP, as we have the district heating CHP here. But I have to highlight that depending on how you model the system, if you were to reduce to change the location of the slug buses, you might be able to solve the solution, to, to get the solution without needing to go into the integrated system. So it comes, it comes back to the, one of the questions mentioned before. Uh, we normally begin with the algorithm without thinking so much into the problem. And the problem might allow us to actually solve this with a more, with an easier approach, which in this case is the decoupled. So we need to understand what's happening in the system before introducing the complex model. Note that the complex model would give you the solution even in the decoupled case, it would just take longer. So it is just increasing the computational costs unnecessarily. This is going to change once we go into optimization because once you start optimizing the system, then every single multi-energy technology will be responding now to economic signals. So that creates active coupling. So why is this valuable once we go into the OPF? We, we will see with some of the approaches used mostly to simplify the OPF. Another important thing to highlight here is, again, that the networks are not only going to be introducing constraints. So this example that I'm showing here is just introducing constraints and losses. So how do we take advantage of the flexibility of the network that was mentioned before? Well, we need to add the equations. I did mention that the formulation that I was providing before was the steady state and we can add much more complex or much more detailed formulation of each of those networks to capture some of their flexibility. So for example, in the heat network, we can capture temperature dynamics. Uh, there are different ways to model them. This particular example uses this as a delay in the temperature spread based on the mass flow rate, that is the movement of water and the movement of water is dictated by the density, the, the area and the length of the pipes. So what this equation is saying is that once you start heating up the network, it's not going to heat at the same time throughout. There's going to be a delay while the heat spreads throughout the network. Why would this be useful from the side of flexibility? Because it allows us to do preheating calculations. If we look into, let's say the gas network, we can play with what it's called the line pack, which is a way of seeing the storage within the pipes 
which is a function of the pressures at both sides of the pipe, uh, the volume of the pipe and the, compre the compression factor of the, of the gas. So what this gives us is an understanding of how much gas we can withdraw from the, from the network at a given time. And we would like to have that extra capacity if we're going to be ramping up some of the, of the generators. So by adding this extra layer of, of complexity, of detail to the network models, we can get a bit more flexibility from, from this system, a bit more options beyond just what you would get from the multi-energy devices. So just a, a, a quick example. In, in this case, what we did is, okay, we wanted to understand the flexibility that we would we had in the particular network in, in the Manchester demonstrator. So what we did is we got rid of all the other sources of flexibility. So we removed all the technologies and just kept the gas boilers to supply all the heat. We even removed other sources of flexibility beyond the, the, the multi-energy technologies, which is for example, the, the buildings themselves because the, the mass of the buildings can also be used as a source of storage. So we got rid of all the normal sources of flexibility and we added some of these of the equations mentioned before to the networks. So we added in this case, just the temperature dynamics to allow us to do uh, preheating. And with that, we just did a small experiment. We just set our, our rule of thumb. Okay, we're going to overheat the network a bit, one hour before the peak. And with that, we need less power during the peak time. So just by doing this small exercise, we can see that the, the network itself is allowing us to reduce the peak. The network itself becomes a, for, a form of storage, which in this case is just using the water. Obviously, the bigger the pipes, the bigger the network, the more water you have in the network, the more flexibility you get here, which would be actually shown in, in some of the tutorials later on. But what this is showing is that the network models are not only introducing constraints, they're also providing additional sources of flexibility. And if we can model them, even though it's going to increase the complexity of the problem, we can get better means to provide energy cheaply. So this small capacity could, could imply at a larger scale, fewer peak, picking units, uh, more, more carbon efficient technologies and so on and so forth. So every little helps in, in this case, in the case of multi-energy systems. So now that we kind of covered the basics of the, of the power flow, now let's move on to the optimal power flow. So in this case, the optimal power flow is going to bring together the network model that we mentioned before with the multi-energy system. So the multi-energy system would be the use of the devices for providing services to the customers. So as it was mentioned before, uh, each of these models, the network models, the multi-energy network models, they're quite complex. So bringing them together increases significantly the complexity of the system. So this type of problem is much more complicated to solve than just the networks themselves, than just the multi-energy system. But it is quite valuable because it allows us to see flexibility that cannot be seen by either of those models. What do I mean with that? Well, I'm saying that the OPF can see more services, more flexibility services, more options than either of the models. Why? Because now you can have the multi-energy system supporting the network and the network supporting the multi-energy system. What does that mean? For example, one example here is this one is for hydrogen. If the multi-energy system had surplus energy, let's say renewables, and it didn't have storage, what could it do? Well, now it has a network and the network can be used as a source of storage. So by coupling the network is adding an additional option to the multi-energy system of using the network itself as storage. In this case, the, the use of hydrogen is limited by the capacity of the device. 
by the energy and efficiency of the device and the limit of the hydrogen blend. These equations would change based on the device and also the, the hydrogen blend is, is shifting. So at, at least in the UK, most of the devices can work with up to 20, around 20% 20 hydrogen. Uh, but in the future, the whole idea is to, to increase it to 100%. So this is using the network to support the, uh, the multi-energy system, but we can do the other, the other way around. Some of the services provided by the multi-energy system could be used to support the network. The whole idea of demand side response. In this case, the distributed uh, multi-energy resources could be used to tackle uh, network constraints associated with, let's say the electric vehicles as the electric vehicles are going to be moving throughout the network. And then we get things like the pandemic that changed the profile uh, of, the, of, of the electric vehicles and it becomes harder to model. If we wanted to reinforce the network to have enough capacity to cope with all the potential locations of the vehicles, that becomes a bit too complicated or too expensive actually. But if we are able to use the multi-energy technologies, which are already distributed, we can use those services to support the network, which is something that the network itself could not be seen. So in summary, once you put the networks and the multi-energy system together within the OPF, you get an effect like one plus one greater than two. You get more from the summation than from the individual parts together. That's what makes the, the OPF quite interesting. But again, very, very complex as each of those models can be quite complex themselves. The combination is just much more complicated. So how do we deal with that? And again, there are some, some methods that were mentioned in the presentation before. We're going to be focusing mostly on three, which is metaheuristics, linearizations, and the compositions and multi-level approaches. Actually, we're just going to be highlighting in the other two and metaheuristics, we're just going to be highlighting why they, they're useful, but we're not going to elaborate too much on them. So the, the metaheuristics basically are, tend to use uh, natural processes such as evolution, such as mo movement of particles to find solutions. So these type of approaches are very general and can be used to find a feasible solution for a system, but there's usually some complications guaranteeing or benchmarking the optimality of these solutions. It, it becomes a bit complicated to find how good or how bad the solution is, but they do provide a solution. So when would we like to use this type of metaheuristics? Well, this can be particularly useful when the, the accuracy of the other models is also uh, quite unclear. Citing, let's say, George Box's idea, we want something that is useful. And if there is uncertainty about the, the accuracy of the mathematical programming model, then it might be useful to use another model that can compete in terms of accuracy re regarding of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the uncertainty. The difference here is with the mathematical programming models, we normally have to simplify the problem. And every time we simplify it, we lose accuracy. We might end up with solutions that are not useful. Whereas with the multi-energy system, uh, with the, uh, sorry, with the metaheuristic, we can use more complicated formulations. Let's say the nonlinear energy hub efficiencies, but it becomes harder to guarantee that the solution is, is optimal. So there is this trade-off between these type of elements. Another thing that can be considered is what happens when we don't know what optimality means. If we have larger systems, let's say if we go beyond the multi-energy and we go into the urban nexus, which is the idea of electricity, heat, gas, hydrogen, transports, agriculture, water, that is the, the full integration of all the different vectors and sectors, then we end up with problems that affect a large number of stakeholders. And once you have something like that, it's difficult to find what is optimal uh, for any of the actors. You start talking to stakeholders and every time you talk to them, they give you different interests, they give you different objective functions. 
So in that case, what becomes more attractive rather than finding a single optimal solution from a single perspective is to look for something or for a large number of solutions that might be attractive for different people. So then you can negotiate the trade-offs. Another advantage of the heuristics is that you can in include uh, rule of thumbs or other applications that are used in practice, which might be a bit difficult to model with traditional mathematical programming problems. So these are one of the, some of the advantages of, of these tools, although that's not what we're gonna be mostly using in, in the rest of the presentation. What we're gonna be using mostly is going to be linearized models and well, let, let's let's begin with the with the linearized models, which you could say are are the most uh, the most established. Uh, even from the conceptualization of of the OPF of multi energy system, there was some discussion of using some linearized approach to capture some of the complexity of the network. And let's say in the in the power system, we tend to use a lot the DC power flow or some some approaches to model the system as set of linear equations. When is that particularly useful? Uh, it becomes particularly useful if the focus of the study is not so much on the networks. So if we're focusing a bit more on investments, if we're focusing more on uncertainty, then it makes sense that we make compromises in other, in other parts, which can be the networks themselves. And also, as time passes by, we start getting better linear approximations. So now we have a couple of models that can capture some of the complexity of the system, even with linear equations. So as, as this uh, area of research evolves, we, we will likely have to do fewer compromises as we would still be able to capture a lot of complexity, even with the simplified models. And some of the simplifications include the typical piecewise linear approximation, that is special order sets type one or type two used to model uh, most type of functions, user bin binaries and, and piecewise equations, Taylor expansion, and some specific for, uh, for energy halves is the change from dispatch factors to state variables to get rid of some of the, the nonlinearities in the energy hub itself. And, Something that was proposed from, again, from the beginning of the conceptualization of the OPF was to convexify the objective function. The challenge is that we, we need to, well, we are developing linear approximations for specific functions. So the, there's, there's quite a few equations that, are, that cause problems for modeling this type of network. In this case, I'm, I'm highlighting a couple, which is in this case, the flow, again, as a function of, of the pressures. You can see a sine function here, which is highly nonlinear in a square root. Also, we have our traditional power flow equations, which are highly nonlinear with sine and cosines. And I didn't put it here, but I would also add the, the, the temperature uh, across a pipe, as that is a function of an exponential. And that particular function for the steady state tends to have issues when the flows are very low. So we, we still need a lot to develop these, these particular equations. And I'm just talking about the steady state ones. I'm, there's still a lot, a lot to do to improve the other ones in, in, in the dynamic realm, which uh, again, it's, it's going to be discussed a bit more in the next uh, few tutorials. So now, the other, the other approach, you know, besides linearization and metaheuristics, is the multi-level approach, which basically separates the problem into smaller, uh, into smaller parts. Let's say you can separate the multi-energy part from the network part. And this is when the whole idea of the active coupling become useful again. Because if you use this type of approaches to separate the system, then you're separating it at a higher level uh, as an optimization for the multi-energy part. And at the, low, at the second stage with a power flow, then you can apply the active or uh, passive coupling knowledge to know how to solve the problem either as a single set of network, a single network or as separated networks. So that's when that knowledge become useful, particularly in the multi-level approaches. 
what is the complication with this type of approaches? Well, we need to exchange information between these soft models. So we create some form of soft coupling, but we need this coupling to make sense to drive the iterations, the exchanges between these models towards an optimal solution. And here we have a couple of, of approaches like Bender's cuts that are trying to push us through, uh, towards a, a good or optimal solution. So one of the challenges with these approaches is precisely that, that, that communication. But the advantage is that as you're separating the larger problem into smaller subproblems, then you can really use detailed analysis of each of those parts as that wouldn't compromise the level of accuracy that you can do in the other one. So it gives opportunities to do uh, some interesting studies. Some of those which I'm highlighting here are the analysis of uncertainty, the use of stochastic approaches. So um, I'm, I'm just going to be highlighting some of the basics, which is the use of scenarios and stochastic and robust optimization. In this case, uh, a, a, basic, a basic stochastic approach, a two-stage approach, what it's doing here, it's, it's recognizing that what you do at a given level, let's say the first level, is going to affect what you do in the second level. What, what does this mean? This could be how investment affects the optimal power flow, but this could be the unit commitment. This could be what you do in, in previous steps. So how, mu how much you use the storage, how that affects what you can do later in the future. And this allows you to do some really interesting, robust type of analysis. So in this case, what you're doing is you're optimizing your decisions at an upper stage, that's a unit commitment, to minimize the costs once you are in real time, let's say the optimal power flow. But you're not bound to just minimize both. You can use other criteria, let's say based on the decision theory, for example, minimax, say maximizing the risk in the other one. So you can minimize the maximum risk at the second stage. You can use mini mean, maximax, or all the approaches that you can find from decision theory. So this can be extended based on, on the risk appetite or how robust the, the system has to be. Now that we're talking about robustness, do we need the system to be robust to everything? Not necessarily. We might be happy with a, just being able to comply with most of the scenarios, but not, not all of them, which is what we can do here with a chance constraint. So instead of making sure that we are targeting both stages, we target a range of the scenarios, which in this case is a probability. So we can, for example, look for solutions that are going to be optimal or feasible 95% of the time, that, that is us recognizing that sometimes it's too expensive or too challenging for the system to be 100% robust. So we can use this type of, of constraints to create those trade-offs. So now that we have those, those components, we're going to finalize with a, a small example and, and again, applications to the Manchester demonstrator with a, a methodology that we like to utilize in some of our studies. Again, I have to highlight that this methodology is not comprehensive. As mentioned before, there are multiple iterations of the models, multiple ways you can account for uncertainty for the networks. But this particular approach provides good means to highlight the use of stochastic optimization, the nonlinear uh, network equations, and it also in, includes uh, an interesting approach for reducing the number of, of variables, which we're going to be highlighting now. So how do we use these for stochastic optimizations? Well, in this case, what we do is we, we start from how this would be formulated traditionally. So the, the stochastic model, the, the first part that is simulating the multi-energy system, it would normally use this type of matrix to represent different scenarios, in this case, four scenarios and three different time steps. 
So this representation here is the same as this tree on this side. So what he's telling us here is the first time step, it's all node zero. Then node zero divides into node one or node two, which is here. And then node two goes to node three, node four, node two no goes to node five, node six, which is this part. And what this equation is doing is introducing the non-anticipativity constraints, which means what you do in the future is affected by, by what you did in the past. So whatever you do in the past is going to influence, is going to increase or decrease the options that you have in the future. So normally we would model it like this, but this require a lot of decision variables. So what we can do is we can use sparse matrix approximations. So instead of modeling the tree as mentioned before, we used a sparse, a sparse matrix like this one. So now we're saying, okay, node zero is connected to node one and node two here. Node one is connected to node three and node four here. And node two is connected to node five and node six. If we pass that into the information that we go, would go into the algorithm, which is the information here, then we would say, okay, node zero is the, this, this is represented by, by the head. So the head is node one, node zero, node one and node two. Say node zero, what is it connected to? Okay, it's connected to position one. Okay, so it's connected to node one. Is that the only one? And no, there's another one in position two, which is node two. Is there another one? Zero represents no. So what this is telling us is again, node zero is connected to node one, node two. What about node one? Node one is connected to position three. Position three is node three. Is that the only one? No, there's another one, node four. So node one is connected to node three and node four. And with that, we create this type of tree. Note that all of these are parameters. The only variables are these. So the interesting thing about this is that now by changing these parameters, we can reshape these trees or we can actually create different forms of scenarios. So this could be a scenario tree or this could be a set of scenarios for robustness. So this formulation allows us to mimic different type of robust constraints or stochastic formulations. And not only that, uh, By the way, Alex, um, I don't know how many slides you've got, but uh, good if we could leave a few minutes for, for questions. So um, if you, yeah, we'll finish in the next few minutes and give some time for Q&A, that, that would be great. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm close to the ending. Brilliant, so, Thanks, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no problem. So what I want to highlight here is that if instead of using scenarios, we used uh, technologies or vectors, we can use the same formulation to create different types of multi-energy systems. So with that, we can have different configurations of multi-energy systems connected to different parts of the network. That means that we can have different systems and we can have different representations of uncertainty. Now that we have that type of formulation, we're, we're, we're finalized with the optimization, we can pass it to the integrated network model, the part that deals with the, uh, in this case, the steady state equations. What this is going to do is it's going to check if there are network violations and if the accuracy of the network modeling is, is good. The optimization is using a linear approximation. So this is checking if the linear approximation is good enough compared with the nonlinear one. If that's not the case, then we're going to replace this linear model with a new model, which is going to be based on the steady state approach, uh, on the nonlinear steady state, linearized at the, uh, at the current point of operation. So basically we're applying Newton Raphson on top of the solution of the multi-energy system. That means we can just identify the binding constraints and how those constraints are affected by different buildings. So once we have that, we have a simplified linear representation of the network 
which we can pass back to the optimizer and we can tell the optimizer how much it has to adjust it to go back into the formulation. So the process can be repeated until we find the solution and that allows us to have uncertainty and that allows us to have the multi-energy, uh, the, 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 the detailed nonlinear formulation. So with that, we apply it to, again, the, the demonstrator and we can have different type of, of operation based on the combination of those models. So the last idea that I'm going to highlight here is that the reaction of the system is affected by the incentives that the multi-energy systems might face. So here they can see the, the network constraints, but the decision to use different technologies is also going to be affected by, for example, whether or not we're providing reserve or not. And if we take this further, if we have different combinations of prices, let's say arbitrage, reserve, reliability, then we can see that there's a lot of different variations in the system based on those signals. What this means is that it's not only affected by the technical limitations of the network, but also by the signals. So in summary, what, uh, what, we're, what we're showing here is that the, the networks are becoming integrated because of the multi-energy technologies. The multi-energy technologies can create active or non-active coupling. And because of the uh, combination of these very complex models, we end up with a really challenging problem, which we have to solve using a variety of approaches. The tutorial wasn't comprehensive on all the approaches, but it provided a small introduction into the main categories. And the use of these models would allow us to consider different integrated networks. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge some, some praise that funded this research. And thank you very much for, for your attention. Okay, brilliant, thanks, Alex. And uh, yeah, we've got a few questions that are coming in on, on the online Q&A. Uh, so I don't know if you're able to, are you able to see them, Alex, yourself, or should I just read them out? I'll read them uh, out anyway, so everyone can know which one we're looking at. Yes. So, uh, so there is, I mean, a first question we'll maybe look at is, uh, in the models, do you assume that the gas is hydrogen? Can the models work for methane as well? Can you imagine two types of, of, of gas in the model? And I think you sort of addressed that a bit when you, when you pointed out that you have a parameter that represents the different kinds of gases in, in the network, didn't you? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it depends on, on the model that we're using, but there, there are some models that go into the blend and that, that affects the efficiency of the different technologies that are considered. So the, the, the thing that was shown here was a different combination of, well, different combination of, of, of models. So there, there were cases where such level of detail was, was included, but, but not, all, not, not always, and that depended on, on the complexity and the focus of, of the analysis. But in, yeah. in summary, yes, that, that can be considered. Yeah, yeah, so in simple terms, it's a, it's a different parameter. Actually, I guess a more complex question is, if you're trying to use a model to decide uh, what the future of the network is, you know, which gas should it carry? And then, and then that parameter actually becomes a variable, I suppose. Mm, yeah, and well, th that is a really difficult question uh, because uh, ultimately, how do you optimize that in terms of which, which objective? Is it going to be just the carbon? Is it just going to be the cost? So I, I would just use the model to explore options, but it's very hard to get a single optimal solution from, from the studies. Yeah. Now, there's another question more to do with the solution method. So um, an anonymous attendee is saying, why not use methods like approximate dynamic programming instead of scenario trees and the spatial matrices that you described? Well, it, it actually depends on, on, on the interest of, of, the, well, of, of the research. So that dynamic programming is, is also quite, quite interesting, especially if, if you can capture the, the path dependencies. But overall, uh, I, I, I have to confess that I haven't tried all the methods for all the combinations. So I'm, I'm happy to see more research, especially if they can come up with something more efficient. I'm very happy to implement it. Yeah, good. Okay, and then 
this picks up an issue that, that Graham and I talked about as well. There's a question from uh, Marina Dolmatova, which says, your model depends a great deal on the availability of data. Is it, is it viable in real life systems? You know, so will the benefits of a co-optimized system still be noticed if we consider all of the data inaccuracies? Uh, that, that is a really good question. Uh, to, yeah, the, it can take us uh, about a year for some cases to, to load the data. So uh, actually we, we're doing a lot of, of work with uh, the local authorities for data collection, trying to create a, a unified database. But yeah, the, the model is very data intensive for, for the type of analysis that it requires. And sadly, our focus has not been so much on the model, but actually on better ways to collect the data. Yeah, yeah, and that, I, should, I should should mention. I mean, I should have mentioned this earlier as well. But um, some of these questions around uh, the usefulness of a model and who is going to use it, how can we as researchers uh, really make a difference with what we're doing? Uh, we've got a really good panel session. It's the last, almost the last session of the conference on on Friday. Um, so in the, in the evening here in Europe, uh, where we've got uh, four people who are going to discuss this question about how you take research into practice. So, you know, we'll come back to some of these issues again. And please, if, you've, if you're able to join us for that panel session on the last day, then, then please do. Um, right, so another question I'll pick up now is uh, from, from Jordan Holviger, which is, there are open libraries available for solving optimal power flows for the, for the power system. Are there such things for a multi-energy system? Well, I wouldn't say such as, op uh, well, it depends on what you mean with open libraries. So sometimes we solve this system using GLPK, which is open source. That said, the algorithm that calls the open source engine is bespoke. So uh, we, we haven't published that open source yet. So uh, I'm not aware of a, a dedicated engine that explicitly addresses networks, but I'm aware of some open source optimization tools that can be applied for developing such models. Yeah, so you're using open source solvers, but then there's still, like you say, there's still the work to kind of uh, define the problem and, and sort of structure it. Yeah, and well, the, the other complexity of the open source uh, tools is that they rely on, op on other open source uh, packages. So for example, GLPK relies a lot on what is called Pandas and Pandas is updated very often. So s some of my older models no longer work, not because of the optimization, but because of that particular uh, piece of software that works slightly different, mm -hmm. differently. Right. Yeah, yeah. So please feel free folks to um, put any more questions on the, on the Q&A. I'm hoping that you can see the ones that have been answered. I've typed in a few answers to the previous ones, but because I've got a kind of host view, I can't quite see if you can see that. So I'm hoping Andre will be able to help me out with that one. Um, another thing that uh, you kind of touched on, and I think Graham touched on earlier as well, I think is that there, there are uh, some, uh, some analogies between, for example, gas pressure, water temperature and say voltage. So do you think there are some limitations to these analogies that we, we ought to be aware of when we're trying to model these different systems and their interaction? Well, yeah, de definitely, uh, especially the, the time domain. But uh, I'm, I'm assuming, well, I'm, I'm actually quite sure that, that Vittorio is going to talk a, talk a lot about, about that as I, I've seen his work. So especially in the steady state models, we we tend to assume that all the networks converge at the same time, all the pressures converge at the same time. So, and if, if we model it like that, then we're making a gross overestimation of the speed of some of those networks. Yeah, it can so some of these systems, with, I mean, yes, they're quite you know, slow, maybe slower than the power system, is that right? Uh, yeah, at, at least the, the, the ones that we mentioned, electricity, heat and gas, the power system is the fastest. So the other ones, it, it's not only the, the, the technical limitations, but also the, the, the economics and, and the markets. For example, the, the, gas, the gas system is dispatched at, at a different scale. So it's, it's, it's yeah. not only the technical side, but also modeling that regulatory parts as well. We tend in the gas system, we tend to think about uh, the energy per day rather than the kind of the power as such, don't we? Yeah, so, precisely. Uh, yeah, okay. 
uh, we're coming up towards uh, quarter to the hour when we're due for uh, a, another bit of a break. I know that uh, Zoom is not always comfortable to sit in front of for long periods of time. So I'm just looking to see if any other things I was going to ask. Yeah, actually, one other thing I was going to ask you, Alex, before I let you go, is uh, I, I like the way that you kind of described heat as a, as a storage medium. I like it because it's generally cheap. But I guess on the other hand, it's also leaky. So do you think we're really able to model those losses over time from heat stores very well in, for example, our scheduling algorithms? Well, personally, I, I still believe we are grossly overestimating the, that, that, that resource ba based on our models. But I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be proven wrong with, with the detailed research on, on, on that area. So I, you say I'm grossly quite... overestimating. So what, 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 do you, what do you mean? Where, where, where are we making, where do you think we're making the error? Or in what way? What, what's the outcome of that error, do you think? Well, the, the, the thing, especially in the, we're, we're basically assuming that the heat is spreading too fast and mm. too, too perfectly. Right. So that, that means we're assuming we have more flexibility than we actually have. Yeah, right. Good point. Good point. I, I tend to agree with you on that. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll call a bit of a pause there. So thanks very much again, Alex. Uh, so we're going to resume at uh, quarter to, sorry, but just quarter to the hour now. We're going to resume on the hour. So uh, where I am in, in the UK, that will be 11 o'clock. So, you know, 15 minutes from now. So again, ha take the chance to have a, have a little bit of a break. And when we come back, then uh, that question about flexibility we've just touched on will be picked up, I think, a bit more by, by Pierluigi, uh, part three of, of this tutorial. So uh, yeah, speak to you again very soon. <laughs>